Hi there. Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Cynthia Leibert and I'm here with my co-host Brooke Jack. And today we're going to be talking to you about perimenopause. Woo-hoo. Great topic. <laughs> Very timely for me, for sure. I'm in my mid forties and certainly experiencing some symptoms up close and personal. And I've been helping women with their hormonal transitions for a couple of decades now. So really glad to be here with all of you and excited to share some information. Yes, I'm excited too, Cindy. I think this is going to be a very valuable session for many women out there and loved ones of women out there to understand what's happening um, with the ladies in their lives. But uh, tell us just starting out, what are your what's your background, your training, um, in this topic and, and what makes you uniquely suited to help people going through this transition? (laughs) Good good question. (laughs) First, I just wanted to give a disclaimer, of course, that I am a physician and this is meant to be purely educational. Of course, you definitely deserve to have some one-on-one attention. So I, I recommend everyone speaking to their doctor before they make any kind of changes in their own health protocol. Um, Definitely before starting any kind of heavy duty herbs or, or um, topical creams that might be over the counter for perimenopausal symptoms. So uh, thanks for asking about my background. I am a family physician. I was conventionally trained. I went to Loyola University for medical school and then came to Asheville, North Carolina for my family medicine residency training at Mayhack. It's affiliated with UNC Chapel Hill and went the conventional route of being a family physician in private practice for actually a number of years before I transitioned into a more holistic, integrative, functional medicine practice where now I currently have a private practice where I help people with complex chronic illness, including hormone imbalance. I'm located in Asheville, North Carolina. And, you know, in addition to my medical school training, which we, we learn a lot about the body, the endocrine system and prescribing hormones for women going through the menopausal transition. However, I did do pretty extensive additional training in bioidentical hormone replacement, herbalism. I've trained with Dr. Tarona Lodog. She's a a physician as well as an herbalist and midwife and just a wealth of knowledge there in herbalism. I also did a mentorship with Dr. Gregory Petersburg. Uh, more than 10 years ago. He's an international hormone expert. I've taken courses through the A4M, the Institute for Functional Medicine. I've studied uh, many books on the topic, Uh, Dr. Gottfried, uh, Sarah Gottfried, and Dr. Sean Tassone. He's an MD, PhD colleague. He wrote the Hormone Balance Bible. So I've I've just really studied up on this topic because it is so important for women. We're we're always in transition with our hormones from you know the transition from childhood and into becoming a woman, childbearing, nursing, perimenopause, which can start quite a ways away from actual menopause, which is absence of the period for, for a year. And so we're always in transition and, and it's a big part of our physiology. It has implications for our mood, our behavior (laughs) relationships. So it's, it's a really important topic. Yeah. And of course I'm a woman myself, as I mentioned, and, uh, in, in my mid forties. And so this is becoming a a very pertinent topic for me. Uh, My mom, unfortunately, did pass away with breast cancer. And so as you probably know that there's lots of controversy, and in my opinion, misinformation Mm. out in the media about the dangers of estrogen being Mm. a carcinogen. And, And so I've taken a deep dive into the scientific literature around the use of estradiol, especially in women that are 
you know, maybe have a family history of breast cancer or even yeah. a history themselves of breast cancer. So we'll, we'll get into that a bit as well. And I have three daughters, so it's, <laughs> hormone health is important. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're, you're going to be well experienced, <laughs> not only in your studies, which have been fantastic, the, all the training and experience that you've had, but also having yeah a whole a household that you get to help guide through mm-hmm. and experience <laughs> firsthand, right? <laughs> yes. We should have my husband on here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he could he could give some input into the perimenopausal <laughs> transition. Yes. So well, I'm really excited. This is actually our first time we're doing a medical Q and A session. I put out a question on my Facebook page, just asking friends to share what their questions are around perimenopause. And we got a lot of responses yes. and we collected those and can field me some questions here. Absolutely. So Elizabeth um, notes that she's getting to that age, but really wants to know how to navigate changes in her body without prescription use and without prolonging the process, which I know that is a common um, desire for many women to know how to, how do we navigate these and, and what to look for specifically when it's actually happening. Okay, great. So several parts to this Mm -hmm. question. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate your question. And I am on the same page with you. Certainly, it's my philosophy to have a, a lifestyle medicine first approach to any sort of hormonal imbalance and, and really reserve prescription hormone intervention to um, cases where where you need it. So I, I would say that uh, for sure, let's, let's not villainize hormones. They're a godsend when you need it. And so that's right. Certainly I keep an open mind about that. Um, there's nothing, we don't have anything to prove by <laughs> battling through uh, that transition without all the support and help that we need. So thanks for your question. And I'd say, let's, let's just start with the topic of what is perimenopause and how do you know when, when it's happening? And it is, uh, you know, first the, your age can give you some sort of clue. Uh, perimenopause can happen early stage. Some women begin in the thirties, but it most often starts in the early forties you start getting changes in menstrual flow, your cycle length. Um, you can have sudden surges of estrogen. So the estrogen level can be up and down. So symptoms can be kind of all over the place from just having emotional instability. Uh, there can be weight gain despite you know exercise or even cleaning up your diet. You know, all, all the things that maybe used to work in the past don't seem to work. Uh, accumulating Mm. fat, particularly around the middle, uh, that can be a sign of perimenopause. Insomnia can happen um, just from, you know, changes in our brain, but also hot flashes, (laughs) night sweats (laughs) can be particularly disruptive to sleep. So that can be uh, a big clue that you're entering into perimenopause time. Uh, Our skin, you know, estrogen plays a huge protective role in our skin. So start noticing some crow's feet or furrowed brow. (laughs) Um, Periods can start to become unpredictable. And then also I I hear a lot of my patients uh, tell me, and and also I've experienced it myself, that just this um, changes, changes in your brain function where you feel more forgetful, start doubting yourself, trouble making decisions, and, and that can be hormonally driven. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's important to recognize these things and have compassion for yourself and give yourself grace for, for things and also reach out for help um, when you're experiencing these things. So, yeah. And of course, you know, when, when we're going through all of these changes, you know, you're not sleeping well, you're irritable, moody, you're gaining weight, 
that can affect our relationships and mm-hmm. particularly intimate relationships, our sex life, mm-hmm. the, as menopause, you know, gets near uh, the estrogen level can go from being kind of erratic and having surges to low estrogen. And that can affect the vaginal tissue cause, uh, you know, dryness and, and discomfort with intercourse. So that can affect our libido as well. Mm -hmm. And many women at the perimenopausal transition really start relying on substances more you know, mm. caffeine, chocolate to give energy yeah. <laughs> and comfort. And then also wine when, when the body is feeling irritable or you're having trouble sleeping, or you're just looking for some comfort. Uh, I will, right. we'll get into the, the fact that wine or alcohol in general can make hot flashes worse and they can disrupt our, our um, physiology in, in ways that contribute to hormone imbalance, but it is something that women often find that they're uh, gravitating toward during perimenopause. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) So that's kind of how, you know, uh, when it's happening, Elizabeth, uh, you know, starting in the early forties, usually the, the changes in menstrual flow and, and any of these other symptoms, you don't have to have all of them. Sometimes they can be more subtle and just maybe a little bit of hot flashes here or there um, as you approach your period in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. And then also in the early follicular phase, right after the period, those are times when estrogen tends to be the lowest. Uh, so, or, or with sharp changes in estrogen level, we can get have hot flashes. And then as we move into our late forties and early fifties, that's considered the later stage of perimenopause for, for most women, uh, the menstrual cycle can start to become more irregular. And then of course, finally stop. And once we go a full 12 months without the period, that's, that's how we define menopause. So it's a moment in time. Perimenopause is the whole transition to that point. And as I mentioned, we start to get a lot more symptoms related to low estrogen as we approach menopause, you know, within six months of menopause, the estrogen really starts to drop significantly. And then Mm -hmm. unfortunately, hot flashes can go on for a good many years after menopause as well. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry to be the bearer of this news. <laughs> so you're saying that usually around early mid forties, you may start to see more of the perimenopause signs, but, um, is there any, um, literature out there about how long that, how many years or the average or a, a normal kind of yeah. range? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So most women start the transition in the early forties and the average age for menopause is 51. So okay. it's usually okay. a good 10 year yeah. transition to menopause. And then of course, then you get lot, lots more <laughs> symptoms as menopause comes on. And, and I should say some women don't experience. Mm-hmm. Some women say I've had patients here or there tell me, yeah, it was a big, nothing. It just <laughs> my period stopped one month and never came back and <laughs> they've never had hot flashes or anything. Yeah. And you know, it, who, who's to say what, maybe there's a genetic aspect of that. Maybe they're having, you know, really healthy diet. Um, their physiology is good. They've got a good microbiome or maybe they're just very lucky (laughs) right? (laughs) because you can do all the right things and and still have rip roaring hormonal imbalance symptoms as you make this transition. So, yeah. And I did also (laughs) want to encourage you, Elizabeth, I'm glad that you're being proactive and you're reaching out and educating yourself. It's such a, a vital thing to do. And I find that it's just not something that, that women talk about a lot Mm -hmm. until you're there. And Mm. I always like to know what's headed at me (laughs) so I can be proactive and prepare for it. So even if you're in your 
late twenties or early thirties, it's good to understand what kind of transitions you might be facing Mm -hmm. because, you know, perimenopause is this foreign concept to, to most uh, younger women. And, and you might not realize it could start in your Mm thirties. Yeah. (laughs) So it's, it's good, Elizabeth, that you're, you're asking about these things. And I, I like the fact that you're looking to do this without prescription drugs. As I mentioned, that's part of my philosophy as well. And we know that the most important things for hormonal balance are what we're eating, how we're thinking, how much you know physical fitness we have, how much movement we get, and then also our uh, nutritional supplementation. So hormone um, prescriptions and creams and patches and and pills, they definitely can play a role in a smooth transition. And in fact, they can have actually some really therapeutic beneficial effects on the body, but I'm, I'm with you in, in the goal of, of trying to avoid them if possible. So let's see, there's just so much nuance to your question. I, I love that, that you're um, asking it, that you're focused on natural approaches. And as you can, you'll find out, this is just a very nuanced topic. So we'll, we'll go into it in greater detail with other questions. Uh, yeah. I do want to, you know, just make sure everybody knows that, uh, it's so individual and, and it is important to have, you know, a physician you trust, who's knowledgeable in this area to, to guide you through the process, unless you're, like I said, one of those lucky women that (laughs) just don't have any symptoms. Well, great. That is Thanks again, Elizabeth. I appreciate your question. All right, Cindy, here's another one. Linda asked about options for pelvic pain or pelvic floor pressure. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, thank you, Linda, for your question. Super, super common concern. And vaginal dryness is a pretty much a symptom of low estrogen. And as I've hinted at that, typically the estrogen declines significantly right around the menopausal transition. So usually in the early fifties, And estrogen is a key hormone for women. It stimulates the, our skin, you know, as I mentioned, it can, lack of estrogen can cause wrinkles and furrowed brow, but it also affects our vaginal tissue. So there's loss of elasticity, thinning of the tissue, loss of lubrication. And of course that can lead to discomfort with intercourse, You can also have just irritation, just dryness, um, itchiness in the vaginal area due to lack of or withdrawal of estrogen with the menopausal transition. When this happens, we're actually more prone to urinary tract infections because of the the loss of the kind of plumpness and thickness around the urethra. So that the urethra, which is the opening where the urine comes out, that can become inflamed and irritated and and more likely to allow passage of bacteria, E. coli into the bladder. So women can start to have urinary frequency, urgency, urinary tract infections. And also incontinence is is part of this conversation as well, Mm -hmm. stress incontinence. Certainly, I think, you know, most women, especially women that have had children and, you know, into thirties, forties and beyond, we can raise our hand with the uh, concern about sneezing, yep. coughing, <laughs> laughing, yes. the, the extra pressure that, you know, causes mm-hmm. some leakage of urine that also has to do with uh, not only like a mechanical, um, weakening or prolapse of the the bladder and the the vaginal tissue, but also uh, because of the withdrawal of estrogen. Mm. And so all of these symptoms are clustered together in in a condition we call it atrophic vaginitis, and it's from low estrogen. And so one of the number one ways to help with that is a topical 
estrogen cream and estradiol cream. There's a, a bioidentical um, prescription called Estrace that's a vaginal estrogen that can be used. Uh, but I've also had success using estriol, which is a weaker uh, form of estrogen that can be applied topically in the vaginal area and DHEA, which is another sex hormone that can be used vaginally. So, um, but you know, the first thing to do, of course, if you're having these symptoms of pain, dryness, pressure is to get a physical exam, a gynecological checkup, just so, you know, the doctor can visualize what's going on, um, mm -hmm. to see if there's any, uh, prolapse of the, the bladder, the rectum, the uterus, uh, those tissues can kind of bulge into the vagina when there's lack of estrogen and that can cause symptoms. Uh, mainly the treatment for it is uh, lifestyle. You, know, you wanna avoid smoking cigarettes, which can deplete estrogen even more. Mm. want to stay hydrated, exercise, keep your weight healthy. And, and as, as I've mentioned as well, topical hormone cream can be very helpful. Um, another, you know, some, some women it's fairly mild and can get away with just doing uh, natural lubricants in the vaginal area. So coconut oil, aloe vera, jojoba, vitamin E, there's, you know, lots of different natural compounds that are helpful. One word of caution is to avoid perfumed products in that area. It's such delicate tissue and you don't want to add any toxic chemicals down, down in your uh, genital area. So natural lubricants can be helpful. Also, another uh, strategy is just to make sure you're staying sexually active. If you know, if you have an intimate partner, um, having orgasms, having sexual activity helps the the vaginal tissue. Uh, the stimulation increases blood flow, and it helps to kind of soften and and thicken up that tissue in the vulva and vaginal areas. Of course, you know, having orgasms also has other positive benefits for our hormone balance. Orgasms relate, uh, release oxytocin, which is the hormone of bonding and connection and love. And oxytocin actually works synergistically with estrogen to help our stress response and to help you feel you know, more loving and connected to your spouse. So those, those are all positive benefits because of the other changes I talked about in, in <laughs> perimenopause right. can strain relationships. So, you know, just, just, uh, being, being intentional about, you know, continuing to nurture the sexual relationship, even through the transition. That just encouraged somebody out there, Cindy. <laughs> I know it did. <laughs> Well, you know, I do, I do hear from a lot of my female patients in their fifties and, and beyond that they just lose interest in sex, which, you know, sometimes they don't, it doesn't, they don't mind and you know, that's okay. But it's my perspective that sex is a very important part of intimacy and bonding. Yeah. And so if that's at all absolutely. possible, we want to maintain that relationship. And there's so many things we can do to, to kind of uh, improve the libido and improve the health of our sexual organs so that sex is enjoyable and, and not uncomfortable. So get a guy and check up, um, do some natural lubricants, stay sexually active, stay away from smoking, good nutrition, you know, you can't underestimate that impact on That's our right. just hormonal balance in general. Um, and then topical hormone cream, estradiol, estriol, or DHEA. And then of course, you know, systemic hormone replacement therapy can also be very helpful in, in keeping the vaginal tissues uh, hydrated and not dry or prolapsing. 
And, and beyond that, there's the whole functional medicine, integrative medicine world where we, you know, take a deep dive into hormone balance. We can uh, do simple blood tests to look at levels, but then there's also uh, very sophisticated urine tests that can look not only at the hormones, but their metabolites. And, and we can fine tune, sort of tinker with the, the pathways to try to optimize hormone balance. Mm -hmm. We can use herbs and nutrients and therapeutic foods. Uh, all of that uh, is, is part of the process of dealing with uh, pelvic pain and dryness. So thank you so much for your question, Linda. I really appreciate that. And oh, I should mention pelvic floor physical therapy is a godsend to a lot of women. And actually tell us about that, Cindy. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about yeah. that. <laughs> I really didn't know that was a thing until I was, you know, pretty far into my private practice. And I learned about a PhD level physical therapist who mm. specializes in, in helping women with urinary incontinence, pelvic prolapse. And so it's way beyond Kegels <laughs> you know about the Kegel exercise. I right. should have mentioned Kegels. Um, Kegels are just exercises to strengthen the, the muscles in the vaginal area. They have to be done properly to, to be effective. So I would encourage you to really educate yourself about how to do a Kegel properly, but that can be helpful in dealing with the vaginal prolapse, but a pelvic floor physical therapist can actually, you know, do an in-depth exam and give you targeted exercises and, and make sure that you're doing them properly. And it, it's been really helpful for a lot of my patients that, that are dealing with incontinence in mm -hmm. particular related to lack of estrogen and pelvic floor prolapse. So I hope okay. I, I touched on all the main points, but you know, there's so much to this topic. So uh, definitely reach out to your doctor, your gynecologist, your family doctor to, to talk more about that. Awesome. All right. So another question for you, Cindy, uh, Shauna brings up something I know she's not alone in, and that is noticing an increase in hair on the face. Uh -huh. So yeah. is that common and, and what natural things could be taken to help with that? Got it. Okay. Yes. Well, Shauna, thanks again for your question. It is definitely a very common complaint. We don't like that. <laughs> <as women. laughs> we don't want to have hair yeah. <laughs> uh, growing on our upper lip or chin, uh, neck, but it is extremely common. So the first thing I would say is, you know, I would want to know your age, your medical history. When did this come on? Has it been present since puberty? Uh, or is it brand new? How severe is it? Are you having associated symptoms? We want to do a physical exam, likely some blood work, um, depending on the severity. So uh, there's lots of different causes of hair growth on the face. Uh, it's common in the perimenopausal transition and after menopause as well, just due to hormone fluctuations, but probably the most common cause of hair growth on the face is a condition called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it is extremely common. I've heard uh, figures between 10 and 20% of the female population have PCOS. It is a very complex endocrine condition that has lots of different symptoms, but the main ones are irregular periods, abnormal weight gain, uh, hirsutism, we call abnormal hair growth hirsutism, as well as acne, uh, and then with the irregular periods comes infertility often. So that's kind of the clustering of symptoms that, that a woman with PCOS may have. Uh, but certainly there's other causes of hair growth. And if it's very severe hair growth, it's coming on all of a sudden, kind of out of the blue. Um, I'd want to know, you know, are you taking a medication that might be triggering that? 
we need to go potentially searching for uh, tumors, mm. adrenal or ovarian tumors that can secrete testosterone or uh, other hormones that, that may contribute to the hair growth. So uh, we'd go through kind of a whole process of, of figuring out what the cause is, but most of the time it turns out to be PCOS or um, just the, the transition, the hormonal transition. And let's see, um, you asked about treatment for it as well. Again, um, I wanted to just emphasize that we would want to, you know, see how severe it is. Is it just like one little stray hair here or there? Uh, that's totally different than, you know, significant hirsutism. Mm. So once we kind of, you know, go through that process and determine the cause, the conventional medicine way to approach hirsutism or hair growth on, on the face or elsewhere, you know, some women have it in between the, the breasts and the lower abdomen, um, on the back, uh, in between the thighs, you know, and just the, the common hair places. Uh, the conventional approach to it is typically oral contraceptive pills. Mm. And I am actually not a fan of mm -hmm. OCPs, <laughs> oral contraceptive pills. I think they're, they're hormone disruptors. They're endocrine disruptors. They, yes. Uh, have estrogen, but then a synthetic form of progesterone called progestins that, that tend to cause a lot of side effects for women. And many times women can be on birth control pills for years and not realize just the impact that they're having on their mood, their sex drive. And, and, you know, of course they can be helpful. They, they have some positive benefits. They can help with acne. They can help regulate the cycles but I'm, I'm not a fan <laughs> of them. And I try to avoid it in my patients at, if at all possible. Um, another conventional medicine approach to dealing with hirsutism is to do an oral medication that's an anti-androgen because testosterone is typically the hormone that's driving the hair growth. So there's a drug called spironolactone. It's a diuretic pill. It has significant anti-androgen activity. And that can be added on, you know, on top of the birth control pills or just alone, but definitely a word of caution, uh, spironolactone and, and other anti-androgen drugs, you don't want to get pregnant when you're taking those, because mm. of course that could be devastating to a male fetus uh, that could be under virilized, you know, um, due to the uh, lower testosterone level. So ah. that's really key. So uh, that's in addition to, um, you know, laser hair removal and electrolysis, uh, ripping the hair off <laughs> with waxing, all, all that shaving. Um, none of that is, is ideal. And of course, in a woman that has an underlying hormone imbalance, particularly, you know, a higher testosterone state, like with PCOS or, or some other reason uh, that even with those methods, even though they're considered permanent, hair growth is likely to recur unless you're on some sort of medication or regimen that is, is suppressing the testosterone because the, the hair follicles just get stimulated again. Mm. So, um, so, so far I haven't really shared any, any great, uh, cures for it. Um, I, I would say it, it is, a uh, when you have hair growth, that's new, it's a clue to just, you know, get seek medical attention and, and also think about what you might be taking that could be contributing to this. Uh, DHEA is a common hormone supplement that's sold over the counter. I don't think you should take it <laughs> without, <laughs> without a doctor's advice, because it is a very powerful hormone in some situations like PCOS, you generally don't want to use that because it can contribute to acne and hair growth. DHEA, uh, can be converted to testosterone. So ask yourself, you know, are you taking any supplements that might have that mm. in it? And another important thing, it's, it's rare, but I've seen it where uh, a husband or 
boyfriend or, or some uh, someone you might be exposed to uh, if they're using topical testosterone cream that can be transferred person to person through skin to skin contact. So mm. if you're having symptoms, you, you may want to just make sure that your partner isn't exposing you <laughs> um, to testosterone topically. So that's another thing to think about. Yeah, um, great tips, Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I've seen it. I've seen a really, uh, terrible case where a woman, I mean, she was just you know, having acne and hair growth and terrible irritability. Um, and we found out it was her hormone or her husband's hormone topical hormone wow. cream. Cause her, her testosterone levels were quite high. So we went wow. investigating and and remedied that situation. Thankfully, it took a couple months for things to settle down, but that yeah. was an important lesson. <laughs> yes, yes, that was. I'm glad she had your help to uh, solve that mystery. Yeah, yeah. And and of course, if if you do have PCOS, which is the most common cause for hair growth on the face, it is vital to take just a whole body approach to that with lifestyle medicine, you know, trying your best you can to stay as active as you can keep your body weight down. Part of the problem with PCOS is that women tend to have high insulin levels. That's part of the hormonal imbalance that happens and that causes weight gain mm. and weight gain causes your insulin levels to go higher. And that can be this vicious cycle. And then with that, with higher insulin, it also drives higher testosterone. So it's just kind of this negative snowball effect. So even though it's harder for women with PCOS to lose weight, it's really critical to do whatever you can mm. nutrition wise, exercise wise, getting good sleep and managing stress, working with your microbiome um, to, to try to keep the weight down. So, so the symptoms are less severe. Yeah. Yeah. Shannon mentions, uh, having some of those experiences, the weight gain, uh, increased emotions, like you mentioned, hot flashes and even brain fog. And uh, I know this was, like you said, we've got a lot of, of response. A lot of people saying, I, I get that. I, I feel that right now so much. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lori yeah. wants to be part of this conversation. Um, and, but uh, there's the question about natural supplements. Um, and we, we've kind of been diving into that a little bit. And what I'm hearing is that a lot of, um, with supplementation, it's going to be unique to you or very customized based on other medical history, um, that, that you may have, but what are some things that maybe potentially across the board, um, would be common to all, maybe not just supplements, but foods. Um, I know you talk a lot about using food as medicine and letting your kitchen be your pharmacy. So maybe there's some things food wise that, anybody, no matter what your medical history, you know, could be, um, putting in their body just to help support it during this time, or maybe key things to try to eliminate from the diet. Oh goodness. How much time we have. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much in here that I really want to dive into. I, I want to acknowledge Shannon's question to, I think you said weight gain, Mm -hmm. emotional emotions. ability, hot flashes and brain fog. So, wow, yeah. those are like all, they can often cluster together in perimenopause, but they also can have their own root causes, each of those symptoms. So we, we can talk about that. And I, I love that you highlighted this topic of, of, you know, customization and personalized supplementation and, and nutrition, because it is one of the most common questions I get from friends and acquaintances is, you know, what, what supplement can I take for, you know, fill in the blank. And when I I'd love to be able to, to do that and give you some quick, easy answer. And, you know, occasionally, sometimes there is, you know, for anxiety, I like to use Lavella. It's a 
uh, lavender essential oil that can be Mm. therapeutic, but even that, you know, we want to go deeper. We want to find the root causes of why Mm -hmm. you're anxious or your hormones are imbalanced or you're having hot flashes. So it's all unique to the individual. And and that takes a kind of some detective work to do, (laughs) (laughs) but, but I definitely can give you uh, a good response to your question about, you know, what general things can we do in terms of nutrition and supplementation just to help across the board with our health and hormonal hormonal balance in particular. So let's see. Uh, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record. <laughs> with, <laughs> sometimes I feel like a broken record with the nutrition advice, but it, it really does come down to uh, just eating whole foods, eating the full spectrum of phytonutrients by getting lots of colorful fruits and vegetables, lots of fiber, all of those plant compounds help to nurture our microbiome and to keep our, our gut bugs happy. And, and that plays a huge role with not only our hormones, but also the immune system, our brain function, just our overall well being and health. So uh, nutrition wise, you want to get lots of plant foods, lots of colors, avoid processed foods, anything with added sugar, preservatives, colors, dyes, pesticides. There's so many things to avoid, (laughs) but pretty much going into the, the, uh, produce section of the grocery store and doing most of your shopping there. And then just a little bit around the perimeter, I mean, some eggs or maybe a little bit of meat. And, Mm -hmm. and that's how you have a healthy diet is, is just doing whole foods Many people react to gluten. Even if you don't have celiac disease, it's possible to have a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which can drive hormonal imbalance. Uh, Many people react to dairy, although, you know, dairy can be a healthy food group. It's just, Mm -hmm. you have to know your individual body. So nutrition wise, that that's some general advice. Also, we haven't touched on it, but Xenobiotics is a term that uh, describes the environmental chemicals that we're all exposed to every day from plastics and just pollution from industry. They're chemicals that actually have estrogen-like properties. So they affect our hormone balance and push us into an estrogen dominant state, which well, we can delve into that later on that, that wreaks all kinds of havoc, you know, the weight gain and heavy periods and mood fluctuations and brain fog. So just doing your best to eat clean foods, you know, organic, no pesticides, keeping plastic to a minimum in, in your life, uh, paying attention to your personal care products, making sure, you know, your lotions, soaps, uh, perfumes, makeup, all of that is as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. I often point people toward the environmental working group, which is Mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization that can help you figure out what products are, are, you know, the least harmful (laughs) and just trying to minimize that. Yeah. That's a great resource. Yeah. So the just general nutrition advice, the, the avoiding xenoestrogens. And then I, I talked about it early on is, is this, you know, the addictive substances, the caffeine, sugar, alcohol, tobacco, even illicit drugs, those can definitely pull us into hormone imbalance. So keeping those in check in our, our lives, I'm not you know, suggesting you have to completely eliminate every drop of sugar, which would be virtually impossible to do. And it can, can be done, but you know, natural sugars and fruit, that's fine for most of us. A cup of green tea a day is fine. And and even some people, you know, can, can deal with coffee and the amount of caffeine there. That's, that's a very individual thing, depending on your genetics and metabolism. 
I will um, point out though that in the menopausal transition, women often start to get more sensitive to caffeine and it can oh, wow. drive heart palpitations, anxiety, insomnia. So if you're experiencing any of that, it, it might be wise to gradually back off on the caffeine mm -hmm. there. And then, you know, general lifestyle factors. We can't forget that trying to prioritize sleep, doing our best to build up resilience to the chronic stress that we all face and, and, you know, developing ourselves spiritually, learning how to, uh, squash our brain ants. We've talked about the automatic negative thoughts that can drive, you know, negative mood changes and, mm -hmm. and create stress in our lives. So that's, that's my general <laughs> response to yeah. that question. So helpful. Yeah. Well, we had, you were mentioning sleep and Carrie uh, ask about night sweats and some difficulty getting a full night's rest, which I uh, know I've, I've had a couple of friends um, in church that have mentioned that same problem and difficulty feeling rested or being woken up with the sweaty, the night sweats or whatnot. So what do you say to that? What are some approaches that may help um, get some more restful nights? <laughs> yes. <laughs> good, good. And I I actually, I, I don't feel like I've fully answered Shannon's oh, question to, no, it's not <laughs> your fault. I just remembered the other parts to her question. Um, I wanted to touch on the abnormal weight gain, uh, part, and that's so common as you know, it, it can be due to other things besides the hormonal transitions. We can just be eating too many calories and that can happen so easy. Uh, it can be emotional overeating or just simply lack of awareness. So mm -hmm. I tell, tell women, and I personally have resorted to this of, you know, using like a, a calorie tracker, at least for a few days or a week or so to, to just see how many calories you're eating and, and how easy it is to eat one, two, 300 extra calories a day. And that oh, yeah. just little bit of too much calories can really add up in terms of pounds over, over time, especially as we're doing the menopausal transition, because our metabolism shifts and we start to lose lean muscle and gain more fat just as a unfortunate part of the aging process. So we really have to be proactive in, in counteracting that. Um, medication, uh, side effects can, can cause abnormal weight gain, particularly medications for seizures, high blood pressure, diabetes, and different psychiatric medications. So, you know, looking at your med list and talking to your doctor about any meds that might cause weight gain. Um, certainly there's underlying medical conditions that can cause you know, fluid retention and just abnormal weight gain, like heart failure and liver cirrhosis, kidney disease, those are you know, very serious and usually have other signs besides just the weight gain. Uh, but um, to tie into Carrie's question with the hot flashes and the sleep deprivation, um, those symptoms can contribute to weight gain because when we're not getting the sleep that we need, that just drives, you know, stress and cortisol, and that can cause excessive weight gain. So we'll definitely want to talk about how to get better sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the moment, um, when I roll out thyroid dysfunction, that's a, an obvious cause of abnormal weight gain, the gut microbiome. I've hinted at this throughout our conversation, but the, the health and diversity of the bacteria in our gut can make a big difference in our hormonal balance and, you know, our, our weight, the healthiness of our weight. Environmental toxicity is another thing on the list that can contribute to abnormal weight gain. Um, so in addition to the, the perimenopause and PCOS and everything we've already talked about, those are, those are other pieces of the weight gain piece. I did also want to touch on brain fog, super common in midlife and beyond, but the, the reasons for that tend to be different depending on your age. 
when I see 20, 30 something uh, person with brain fog, it's typically stress and sleep mm-hmm. deprivation mm-hmm. and what we call HPA axis dysfunction, where, you know, you just having cortisol imbalance and your system is, is, um, you know, in a sympathetic dominant state where it's, it's the fight or flight response. And, and that can cause significant brain fog and that tends to respond to sleep and stress management and gentle adaptogenic herbs, things like that. So at that age group, and then with the perimenopausal transition, it's likely, you know, more likely uh, the estrogen fluctuations are contributing. And then as we get older, it can be, you know, uh, signs of neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease or other uh, forms of dementia. So I have a whole process uh, of how I approach brain fog. We look at inflammatory and infectious causes, uh, blood sugar balance, how uh, trophic factors, which are like estrogen, thyroid, B12, vitamin D. We look at toxicities, vascular flow, and any any brain trauma. So that's kind of in a nutshell. My approach is just trying to identify the root cause and then address that. So great. I think I think we've done uh, a good enough job for Shannon's question there. Let's let's move back on to Carrie. And you said she had a question about hot flashes and night sweats. Yes. And how to get a full night's rest. What are some, uh, a holistic approach <laughs> that might help? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely want to know the age of the person and if it's late forties, early fifties, and you're having hot sweat, uh, hot flashes and night sweats, which is basically a, a night sweat is basically a hot flash at night <laughs> that wakes you up and <laughs> makes you sweaty and, and miserable. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> the most common cause of that by far is the perimenopausal menopause transition. Um, certainly there's medical conditions that can uh, cause night sweats, you know, um, scary things, cancer and, and other um serious medical condition. So if it, if it's not, you know, right at the right time around menopause, or if you're a man or, um, you know, it's, it's wise to see your doctor if you're having night sweats, but assuming, you know, it's not due to a medication, um, or a medical condition most likely causes is hormone fluctuation. Um, Mm -hmm. I do also want to really highlight the alcohol piece (laughs) alcohol can totally bring on hot flashes and, and make them worse. And so, you know, I, I tell women to try to minimize that and and even eliminate it for a while to see how, how that um, impacts their hot flashes and night sweats. And a lot of times women don't want to hear it, but right. It's the truth. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So So all the lifestyle things that I talked about, you know, with our last question apply here for sure, Mm -hmm. first and foremost, but, you know, going into more of a naturopathic kind of um, functional medicine, integrative medicine approach, I would, you know, look at the whole person and say, you know, what's your microbiome doing? Are there hormonal imbalances elsewhere? Do you have something going on with your thyroid? Uh, how's your sleep and stress and relationships. Um, so we definitely do a holistic approach there. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? It's, it's super common. Uh, about 80% of women deal with hot flashes at some point. Oh, wow. So it's, it's pretty much <laughs> so bra- brace yourself is what you're saying. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, actually, you know, 20, only like 20 to 30% of women end up seeking medical care because of hot flashes. And I would, I would like to encourage women to reach out to, to, I, uh, someone in the kind of integrative world is the, the conventional treatment for hot flashes is typically, you know, rule out the medical stuff. Uh, make sure there's no drug or anything causing it. 
counseling you about lifestyle things, which is important. But then the next steps are synthetic hormone replacement and antidepressants. And, and I'd say, you know, if the hot flash is being caused by a hormonal imbalance, let, let's not just kind of band-aid it with an antidepressant, which, you know, sometimes it's indicated, sometimes it's helpful, but that that's the conventional approach. Um, so I, I would tend to gravitate to an integrative um, holistic physician uh, to address this. And, you know, many times it can be dealt with n- without going on to hormones, you can, you know, just deal with the oxidative stress in the body with supplements like N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, uh, taking away stressors on the body. So dealing with any kind of underlying infection or dysbiosis in the gut, those things can be helpful. And there's a whole plethora of herbs that can help with uh, hot flashes and, and more the stress response and, and sleep. So, you know, we can use 5-HTP, which is 5-hydroxytryptophan. It's a nutritional compound that helps the body, gives the body the raw material to make more serotonin Mm -hmm. that can help kind of lift the mood and improve sleep. And, and as a result, then help with hot flashes. Uh, We can use gentle herbs, valerian root, passion flower to, to help with sleep. Uh, we can use GABA and L-theanine. <laughs> um, there's just a whole slew of things, but it's about finding, you know, one, two, three different compounds that are most specific to what you're dealing with and your physiology. Um, mm-hmm. And then of course, there's hormone replacement therapy, which can be remarkably effective at helping with hot flashes. And, you know, that can be through patches or creams. Um, Typically I don't give estrogen by mouth that tends to be uh, increase the risk of side effects, cardiovascular side effects. Uh, So I do that topically, and then we can use oral progesterone, which is, a magical elixir for many women for their sleep. It, it has a, you know, really calming impact and sleep inducing impact on the body and, and can really help balance out that uh, fluctuations in estrogen and estrogen dominance that often happens as we go through menopause. Nice. So that's kind of a super overview of how to deal with uh, night sweats and hot flashes. Yeah, that's great. That's great information. It's going to put a tool in somebody's toolkit today. That's awesome. So uh, another question um, from Ashley, she mentions that uh, some of her, her family members uh, began perimenopause at a fairly early age and talk to us, Cindy, about how common that is or kind of what to expect if you have a familial history of um, early onset perimenopause. Yeah, okay. So menopause, which is defined as no periods for 12 months, if that occurs before the age of 40, it's considered premature. It, it's fairly common. Uh, to, to go through menopause earlier. And that can happen for various reasons. Of course, there's artificial reasons with medical interventions. If you go in and remove the uterus, sometimes that even if the ovaries are left um, in place within a few years, because of loss of blood flow, the ovarian function can start to wane, but certainly removal of the ovaries and uterus can cause a a you know sharp <laughs> descent into menopause abruptly, and, mm. and when that occurs before age forty, it's a real it's a big deal. It it really impacts brain health. We know that women that have an early hysterectomy are actually more prone to having Alzheimer's disease, and oh, can wow. give you you know bone loss and lots of other symptoms. So I highly highly recommend anyone having an early hysterectomy to, to go immediately on to a really good bioidentical hormone replacement regimen for sure. 
Um, but certain drugs, chemotherapy can cause premature menopause. And, and most of the time we don't know the cause. It, there's tends to be a genetic component to it because it can run in families. But there's also um, some suspicion that autoimmune conditions can contribute to premature menopause, things like okay. Hashimoto's disease, which is a common cause of hypothyroidism, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, those conditions can predispose a woman to early menopause. And, but mainly it's, it's genetic and it's just, you know, the same things apply. You just want to be proactive. And if you're having symptoms, you know, make sure you get help uh, right away. So you can avoid the complications of having prolonged life with lack of sex hormones, which, you know, really affects all you know, our bone health, our skin, our libido, our vaginal tissues, our heart, our brain, all of that. So it's important just to reach out and, and get help. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay. Let's see. Did we want to talk further about loss of sex drive? Okay. Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we end with that? <laughs> we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, I think it was it Janice that asked that question. Yes. I think yes. I remember her Janice. comment. On yes. About it's it a being sad, sad. A sad reality. <laughs> yes. It's... Yes. Yes. Janice, thank you so much for bringing up that topic. It's, um, it is sad and it happens to a lot of women for sure. And I would say that, you know, our brain is the most complex, <laughs> biggest part of our sex drive is, is, you know, our thoughts and our relationship uh, with our spouse. And so, you know, it depends on when it's happening in life. Of course, if, if it's happening at the menopausal transition, which I'm assuming that's what we're talking about here, uh, then, mm -hmm. you know, it's likely due to hormonal shift, uh, but our, the health of our relationship, how, you know, we're, we're the flow of communication and you know, just uh, the state of our our marriage can play into our libido, um, body image becomes a, well, it's a concern at any age or <laughs> really for women. We all can probably point out lots of things about our body that we don't like, but especially, you know, with the weight gain that happens around perimenopause for many women, body image can play into low libido. And then as we've talked about with the vaginal atrophy, the atrophic vaginitis that happens with the withdrawal of estrogen, the, the tissue becoming less lubricated and thin, you can have pain with yeah. intercourse. So that can play into it. So definitely mm -hmm. get that addressed. Uh, many women, huge number of women take antidepressants SSRIs, which stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, things like Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, those drugs are notorious for um, dampening the libido and even making the genitals have a sensation of numbness mm. and making it hard for you to reach orgasm. So that's a terrible combination, <laughs> right? <laughs> or a terrible yeah. side effect, especially mm -hmm. for an antidepressant because that's depressing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, You're maybe right. talking to your doctor about alternatives to an SSRI, there's things like Wellbutrin and other categories of antidepressants that are less likely to cause sexual dysfunction. And of course there's, you know, other natural things to, to try to work on for depression as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, low testosterone can contribute to uh, lack of desire, uh, trouble having orgasms, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, there's ways to naturally boost testosterone, which number one is exercise and particularly right. exercise with your spouse can, can help with libido because it boosts testosterone in both of you. <laughs> um, you know, we think about testosterone as being the male hormone, but it does play a very important role for females and uh, sexual drive is one part. 
of that. So one to tend to all those obvious things that I just spoke about. And I do want to just say a brief word about supplements. There's so many <laughs> supplements targeted for men and women on the internet. And I just want to give a word of caution mm. about that. I, I personally don't recommend buying supplements off of Amazon or, you know, the internet in general, unless you're buying directly from a manufacturer that has a really good reputation and yeah. consumer labs.com is an independent non uh, well, an independent group that, that puts out reports on various supplements about their safety and quality and cost effectiveness. So that's a good resource. I think it is paid resource um, for, for a relatively low fee. You can get a hold of that information. Um, and, and there's a lot of adulteration, contamination in yeah. products. And because it is such a lucrative business, many um, people with lack of integrity get involved in the supplement uh, business online and they formulate products that have maybe just the names of really good herbs but they'll, they'll lump it all into a proprietary blend. So they don't tell you the number of milligrams mm. of each and it's way below the therapeutic levels for those. So you really want to get, you know, good <laughs> supplements from reputable, preferably, you know, health professional companies yeah. that, that really are, uh, have high quality control and integrity. So I just wanted to, to, let everybody know to be wary of online supplements to boost your libido. There, there are herbs that can be helpful, but again, we come back to that personalized, you know, uh, approach to dealing with whatever imbalance you may have. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, along those lines, just doing a, a functional medicine approach where we look at your whole health, um, doing a deeper dive into hormone balance with like a, a urine, Dutch test, a dried urine test that can help us see all the metabolites and, and try to fine tune things there. So, and then hormone replacement therapy can, can help with low libido, particularly the testosterone. I find that, um, you know, a little topical testosterone in the vaginal area and over the clitoral area, it can be really helpful in increasing sensitivity and um, ability for women to have orgasms and mm -hmm. just making it more pleasurable. So yeah. that that's in a nutshell, the answer, mm -hmm. what a good way to end. Yeah. <laughs> our Q and a, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Brooke, for being yes. here with me. And thank you all to all the women that responded to my question on uh, social media. And I just love it. I love interacting with you in this way and look forward to doing more of these. We're going to, you know, choose different topics going forward. We'll have one on hypothyroidism and gastroesophageal reflux disease and brain health. We'll, we'll do you know, one, once a month or so that's our, our goal, at least right yeah. now. <laughs> so, um, I just, uh, thank you all for being here and I encourage you to join our community membership, the, the joy prescription at the joy .com. That's where we actually go deeper into topics like this. Um, mm -hmm. we're going to be doing, I'll, I call it a perimenopause primer, what you need to know before you see your doctor to talk about hormone therapy for perimenopause. So uh, we'll be doing that. And I invite you all to, to join the membership. So you get access to that and all the other wonderful things that we're doing on the joy prescription. Yeah. Join us. We'd love to see you. <laughs> Thanks Brooke. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. See you later.